Thank you all for coming out. Where's your tie, Brad? <laughs> Nick's making me look bad already. So uh, I'm a technology reporter for the New York Times. I'm also a Seattle resident. And um, I've known Brad Stone, I think, for, I couldn't really figure it out, but late 90s, probably maybe around 2000. We started covering uh, this first wave of the commercial internet when there were all these crazy companies emerging, including a company called Amazon.com. Uh, we were both rem reminiscing about a tour that we took of uh, what at the time was one of Amazon's first uh, major warehouses in a place called Fernley, Nevada, and uh, how far the company has come since then. Um, so I want to welcome you here to Seattle, to Amazon's home turf. Um, how many Amazon employees in the audience here? Show of hands. Okay, we got a few. Okay. So if you could all leave right now. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, was reading, uh, I was reading your book this weekend, and uh, there just, it's a really interesting multifaceted portrait of the company. I think you get a real sense that Amazon is visionary, uh, they're innovative, they're relentlessly customer focused, um, and also at times ruthless, uh, I think it's fair to say. Uh, when you decided to write a book about the planet's most powerful bookseller, did it ever occur to you that uh, they might uh, just squash your book if they, didn't, uh, if they didn't like the product? Absolutely. No, there is a central awkwardness to writing about Amazon, and you really feel it when, you know, over the last few days I've walked into a couple of bookstores um, to talk about the book, and of course, um, there, it is a little unusual. Um, their, their world, in some ways, revolves around Amazon. And of course, Amazon itself is probably the biggest seller of the book. Uh, but but uh, uh, luckily, they've been great and uh, have done a great job of presenting the book. And uh, so far, so good. And I think one of some of the most interesting anecdotes in the book are about their dust-ups with the publishing industry, which, of course, is, you know, you're, you're, you're working for them in writing this book. I mean, at one point, uh, Amazon executives actually refer to them as gazelles, and they're they're the cheetah uh, in that. So it's uh, it's interesting. Anyway, um, I think that uh, you know one thing I, I I thought would be interesting to discuss is why now. Uh, when you went to Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, and said, uh, you know, will you cooperate with this book? He he actually declined to at least officially uh, cooperate, although he did uh, you know consent to have family and friends talk to you. Why did you disagree? Why did you feel like now is the right time to write this book? Well, th there's definitely a larger you know, trend here and awareness of these technology companies that are changing the way we all live. And that's not just Amazon, but Apple and Google and Facebook. And you know, we've been covering Amazon for, you know, for more than a decade. And you know, in that time, I really you know, watched some great books come out about Amazon's rivals. You know, there, there was obviously the great Steve Jobs book by Walter Isaacson. There have been a number of great Facebook books, uh, some great Google books, and, you know, there have been a few Amazon Chronicles, um, including, you know, w actually one particularly good memoir called Amazonia that came out, I think, in about 2002 or 2003. But, you know, never a real kind of accounting for the way in which this company has changed the way we shop the way we read, and now the way Silicon Valley technology companies are, are born on Amazon servers via AWS. And frankly, I just saw an opportunity. Uh, you know, the company's about to turn 20. It's, it's an incredible story of a, a rise, a near death in the dot-com bus, and then an incredible resurgence, all driven really by the relentlessness and inventiveness and high standards of, of its founder and visionary. So to me, it was a perfect time uh, from the perspective of the market and the story. And yeah, Jeff often says it's too early to tell the Amazon story, and I think it's, that's revealing of how grand his ambitions are, but also the way in which he kind of tends to you know, keep us pesky journalists at arm's length. Do you think he's holding out to do his own book at some point? Is, is, was that part of his I motivation? I think he's pretty oversubscribed at this point with uh, Amazon, Blue Origin, the Washington Post Company, uh, a venture capital firm. I mean, the, part of the problem with these, w with books about business and technology, technology companies in particular, is that it's such a moving target. And when you pick a point in time to, to write about it, the company very often is, is different, you know, two years. I mean, in, in the course of this book, uh, I think as you were closing it, Bezos bought the Washington Post, so he became a, 
a media mogul. H how did you sort of deal with that uh, difficulty of writing? Right. And book? let me tell you about the, the surge of sweaty panic that came over me <laughs> when he bought the Washington Post in August as my book was basically at the copy editor. But I think that's one advantage of writing about a company, you know, that's be way beyond its adolescence. I mean, there, you know, there have been, you know, recently a, there was a Netflix book and a Groupon book and maybe even the Facebook books, like they're way too early in some respects, you know, because the story is untold. You know, with Amazon, of course, the company is dynamic and changing almost every day. We get a new press release. But I think, you know, it, it's a, it was a good moment in time. It turned out to be a good moment in time to take a look at it. And then I just, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about in the very last chapter how I could future proof it. So at the very end of the book, I kind of ask and answer a series of questions about uh, Amazon's future. And that's just a very deliberate effort of, uh, to try to be relevant in 2014 or 2015. There's a, a dichotomy that uh, you talk about in the book. I don't know which, uh, if there's a business theorist that it came from, but this distinction between missionaries and mercenaries. Jeff Bezos often talks about that difference, and he very much puts himself in the missionary camp. What is the mission of Amazon, do you think? Right, so that dichotomy actually uh, was often uh, articulated by John Doerr, an early Amazon investor and board member. And I think he got it from a book called The Monk and the Riddle, written by one of his colleagues. And it's basically, you know, missionaries have a, have a purpose and a higher goal and are out to build a lasting company. And mercenaries, you know, the strict definition is they tend to be in it for the money and want to flip the company um, and, and sort of more broadly are, you know, sort of ruthless. You know, I would say, uh, you know, Bezos' broad mission is to, is to build a lasting customer-oriented company. Um, you know, s specific missions with the Kindle is to make every book available in 60 seconds or less for download. But, you know, it's a little mercenary as well, and I kind of had fun with that um, because, you know, you look at the business history and the way in which, you know, they've gone and pursued some competitors, uh, you know, leveraged acquisitions of rivals like Diapers.com and Zappos. You know, there's a little, you know, there's a little bit of mercenary nature to Amazon too, and 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 perhaps that's a requirement of doing business on the internet these days. But the the, the big idea, though, is this notion of not being focused on your competitors and focusing on your customers, delighting customers. I mean, they they repeat these words just and have for for now over a decade. What does that mean? I mean, as you as you were uh, finishing up this book, did did you? I mean, it's like a religion there, isn't it? And, and how does that gr get drilled into people, and, and what are the different forms that it takes? That's right. It's no accident that we are in a church right now <laughs> <laughs> talking about the religion of Amazon. Um, you know, Je one of his talents is clearly, you know, the, the sort of clarity of his communication and, and the way in which, you know, he is repetitive, and it's frustrating for us as journalists, but he's, he's you know, reinforcing the same thing over and over and talking usually above our heads as journalists and right to his customers. And, you know, like all big, complex companies changing the world, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's complicated. There's not kind of one single truth. You know, Amazon is customer focused, but it's also, you know, pretty competitor focused too, certainly aware of what its competitors are doing. Um, you know, it's focused on its customer and, ha and has a noble mission, you know, but at the same time it moved quickly into ebooks because it feared Apple or Google might get there. And it, you know, pushed the, the, the publishers, you know, in, into digital, but it did so in a way that arguably left a lot of bitter feelings and probably then resulted in, you know, the multi-year conflict over the pricing of ebooks and an antitrust case. Um, so, he's very, Jeff is very strategic in his communication, and I kind of have fun in the book really exploring, you know, what the real character of the company. At, at one point, uh, well, one, of, one of my favorite quotes about Amazon, which I think really captures a particular kind of view of the company, was by a writer for Slate, Matt Iglesias, who I think a year or two ago after Amazon reported yet another quarter where it uh, lost money. Um, he said, Amazon, as far as I can tell, is a charitable organization being run by elements of the investment community for the benefits of consumers. And they, they really don't make a lot of money, as, for, as powerful as they are. Um, we're, we're used to a lot of technology companies that just kind of gush profits, but Amazon doesn't. And they do it because of this customer-centric focus, I think, and because they're also making these long-term bets. It's really about long-term thinking. How do they, but, and, and yet, as a, 
stock story. It's been huge. Their, their stock has run up. They've been a huge Wall Street success story. How did they suspend the normal rules of physics in, in running this company? Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost the central Amazon question right now. I would argue that actually Amazon is quite profitable, but that it hides its profits. So that, you know, we, for, for years, it, it just frankly wasn't profitable. You know, lost a ton of money in 2000 and 2001, I think over a billion dollars in 2000. And then in two, 2003, they kind of solved the complexity and chaos of their, of their business. They figured out the fulfillment centers, they cut their costs, and they posted their first year profit. And then in about 2005, 2006, you know, Amazon Prime emerges and their flywheel, you know, the way in which all the aspects of the company fit together really starts to take off. And if you look at the quarterly reports in, in 2009, 2010, they made a, you know, a fair amount of net income. And it's at that point that the big, large institutional shareholders, the, the leg masons of the world, you know, really start to bet on Amazon. And 2009 is particularly the year, and probably 2010, Amazon stock goes way up, and we start to think of Amazon, this company that spent all these years in the desert, in the same breath of Apple and Google and Microsoft as one of the giants. Well, since the, then, um, they've done a very good job of basically telegraphing their moves to the investment community um, and being very explicit about that, you know, they're entering a growth phase, that they're going to build fulfillment centers all over the country to get closer to their customers, or they're going to invest internationally or roll out new devices. And like a baseball player who calls his shots, you, you know, the, the, the manager, the, the investors observing, ha have like complete and utter faith. And part of that, I think, is the magic of, well, is the record of being right and calling your shots. And part of it is the magic that Bezos has as a founder, entrepreneur, operator, who has, you know, been through the desert and proven himself over and over. And we'll see, and maybe even on Thursday when they report uh, their quarterly earnings, whether any of that confidence uh, starts to erode. But so far, investors just believe in the Amazon story. Yeah, my own theory about this is that uh, CEOs, among all of their different responsibilities, uh, one of them is to be a storyteller. And, um, and that Bezos has been particularly good at telling the Amazon story. He puts out every year this uh, share, uh, shareholder report, which is, you know, kind of almost become like Warren Buffett's uh, shareholder letter. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it says the same things over and over again, but, um, but it really tells the Amazon story. And I wonder if it partly comes from the fact that he's a book lover himself. He, you know, books are in and stories are in the DNA of the company. And, you know, he's married to a novelist too, right? Absolutely. And, you know, somebody told me, uh, a colleague of Jeff's very early on, that he goes to school on everybody. Like, there's not a book that he reads or a figure that he studies where he doesn't derive you know, some wisdom and incorporate it into his own mental model. And I think with the letter to shareholders, you know, that's Warren Buffett. And, um, you know, he's sort of <laughs> learned the, the practical value of being thought of as a business philosopher and the credibility that ultimately that can bring you. Well, let's talk a little bit about Bezos and his long-term thinking. So uh, he's, he's making all these investments that, you know, are, are, are building, you know, Amazon out for, for the years to come. What are some other favorite examples of yours of, of the type of long-term thinking, either related to Amazon or other, any other part of his life? Well, I mean, there's so many exa interesting examples, you know, throughout the course of Amazon history. You know, back in, in 1998, when they're basically still just selling books and, and, and may maybe like, you know, DVDs and CDs, and he starts to hire executives from Walmart. And we were talking about Fernley, Nevada, you know, one of the first five big FCs that Amazon owned. And he, you know, he, he sits down with Jimmy Wright, who is this distribution chief, former, formerly of Walmart, and he says, you know, build me the uh, 700,000 square foot warehouse. And Jimmy Wright says, you know, what are we going to ship? And he says, everything. You know, I want, I want a warehouse that will hold everything but an aircraft carrier. That's the exact quote. And it's an incredible... Wasn't it kayaks? Didn't you say something about kayaks? That was too? very early on, uh. Uh, where he was telling Nick Lovejoy, an early executive who was a kayak fan, I want to not just sell the book about kayaks, but the kayak itself and maybe a kayak trip. So, you know, he, I called the book The Everything Store because he had this vision very early on that they could be a kind of Sears or Walmart of the Internet. But to think in 1998, emboldened by all the free capital, you know, that's coming as a result of the dot-com boom, that he goes and basically pushes more chips onto the table than anyone else in business, in the Internet. And it's a 
example of incredible vision and long-term thinking and, and risk-taking. I mean, essentially, you know, he's quite a gambler, and he's been willing to push Amazon in, in new directions when, you know, it's certainly not clear to the rest of the world that those bets can pay off. And what else, what else from his, you know, his, his personal life? I mean, he's got all these other endeavors like the 10,000-year clock. What's that all about? Right. Uh, that is a, uh, you know, <laughs> a mechanical timepiece that they will build in his ranch in uh, Texas that will measure time on a millennial pace, and I guess chime every uh, 100 or 1,000 years. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a, so it's he'll a get symbol. So he'll get to hear a chime once? <laughs> If that, I, it seems like an incredibly d complex engineering project and something that might take many decades. Well, um, we're in Seattle, so this is Amazon's hometown. Uh, what's it like to work there, do you think? I mean, we, we should ask people in the audience, but I mean, you talk to, uh, you know, incredible range of people, ex-Amazon uh, executives, employees. What's your view of what it's like to work there? I think the first thing I would say is that there are, ob are obviously a range of experiences in Amazon, and it, it probably has to do with who your boss is and what department you work in. And I talk to some people who love working there and, and uh, have been there for years, and I talk to other people that stayed about four months and left screaming and pulling their hair out. Mm -hmm. So I think it's tough. Um, you know, Amazon posts its corporate values on its website, and one of them is um, I think it's, it's disagree, have backbone, and commit. And, and in the description, uh, they talk about social cohesion. Basically, the idea that, you know, that you're polite and agreeable. And Bezos doesn't like it. You know, he believes that you know, people need to you know, disagree and stand up what they believe, for what they believe in, and that kind of truth emanates through you know, collision of ideas. And, and look, and he's, he's the classic you know, founder, operator who cares more than anyone, you know, in the mold of Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. And there's a reason why, you know, these guys are, are where they are. I mean, they've got incredibly high standards. They demand that everyone around them think big. So I think it can be unpleasant. What is the kind of urban uh, side of Amazon? Uh, you know, does it, does it have anything to do with them or shape them in any u unique way? Uh, it, where you live in San Francisco, so many of the big technology companies are down in Silicon Valley. Uh, so many of them, in fact, that you know, there's a private bus system that ferries Google, Apple, Facebook employees down there. Amazon's in the heart of a city. It has about 15,000 employees here, 100,000 total. Uh, what does that say? I mean, what is, uh, did you find some way that that influenced the company and, it's, and, it's, uh, and how it is? Well, know? I will say I think it's an enormous advantage that they have, that they've, they have this you know, awesome headquarters in South Lake Union. And, you know, in contrast to, to Microsoft, which is out in Red Redmond, I mean, Amazon just has a much more dynamic environment. In terms of how it shaped them, it, it, it might have built character in the early years when they were down in the Columbia Building on 2nd Avenue at a, at a time when that neighborhood was uh, interesting, <laughs> more, more interesting perhaps than it is now, and, and workers were stepping over, you know, homeless people to get in, and, and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very frugal company. You know, Bezos read Sam Walton's autobiography very early on and, you know, and, and learned that the way to deliver low prices to customers is to create, you know, a, an efficient cost structure. And it's why, you know, employees of Amazon are paying for parking and paying for their meals um, and, and why there aren't a lot of, uh, you know, Google-like perks working at Amazon. And, and maybe, you know, early on, some of the, you know, the, the urban kind of setting of Amazon reflected that. The, the growth here is incredible, too. I mean, they've, they're, as you know, they're building skyscrapers uh, down in the Denny Triangle. They've completely changed the South Lake Union neighborhood. Um, they're really going to become a, a huge presence here. We'll continue to be. They already are. Um, I think there's great S Seattle pride in the company, um, but also uh, Seattle's a, a, a literate city. I mean, we like our bookstores. Um, and I think there's also some misgivings that I detect uh, among Seattleites I talk about, I, I talk to about how quickly things are changing, how it's impacting neighborhood retail. That's something that you see all over the place. Do you see any sympathy among people at Amazon for the impact that they're having on neighborhood retail, bricks and mortar retail? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, what they would say is that, you know, these are large markets. You know, it's, it's a lot of these tech companies, as you know, they, they, even when they're, you know, 50 billion in, in sales, they have the mentality of when they were, you know, a billion in sales. You know, it's like, it's like the, you know, the adolescent, you know, who starts wearing size 12 shoes 
but you know it's moving around like you know like like there's still 12. And I think Amazon manifests some of that now, you know, that I, they don't maybe quite understand the impact that they're having, but also they're strategic about all these things and, and, and they know that, you know, every big retailer for the last hundred years has, you know, engendered that kind of negativity from, you know, the A&P grocery store in the 1930s to Woolworths and Sears and more recently Walmart, you know, and, and so in the book, I, uh, you know, was very proud to acquire an internal Amazon memo because, as you know, like nothing leaks from Amazon. Whereas at Yahoo, I don't think a, a memo has ever been written that hasn't leaked. <laughs> but, it, but there was this memo that I got, you know, was Jeff titled it Amazon.love, and it was him basically thinking uh, out loud when we get to the scale of a Walmart, you know, how do we ensure that we, you know, avoid some of the negative reactions and, and, and ensure that we're loved instead of feared. And his conclusion, you could see it in the book, is basically as long as they're perceived as inventive, you know, and innovating on behalf of customers, then you get, you know, uh, then, then your image can be a little brighter. How do, it's, it seems almost inconceivable that, that they could be loved and be a uh, hundred plus billion dollar company. I mean, at that point, you know, uh, antitrust regulators start getting really interested in what they're up to. At, at what point do you think it's going to be just, you know, difficult for them to kind of keep that up? I think we're already seeing it, you know. Um, you mentioned, you know, the Seattle Times series last year, um, you know, some of, the, some of the coverage in the Times. I mean, generally, you know, these companies get so big, and, and certainly, you know, Google is seeing this right now. Um, I think maybe Apple, for some reason, has a little bit of a pass. Uh, but, um, you know, they naturally, and it's, you know, it's part of our jobs. Um, you know, they get they get put under the spotlight. I mean, in, in a sense, this is what winning is it looks like in business, right? You get so big and successful that you start to have an impact on 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 the economies around you. And um, you know, it'll be interesting for Amazon because they're so inward looking, and they're you know they they don't spend a lot of time on public relations. I was thinking of a way to say that diplomatically. Uh, that they probably, you know, will have to get a little smarter about how they handle the, the, the natural image problem that comes from being so successful. Right, and there was, there was also a really uh, interesting period a year or two ago where their warehouse workers, I mean, this is kind of an ongoing issue for them, but in, in Pennsylvania, uh, there were, you know, excessive heat uh, problems in their warehouses, and they had ambulances outside that they were stationing, stationing to, to, to catch people as they were falling from heat stroke. Is that... Are they through that, do you think? Are they, are they treating their, their warehouse workers well? Well, I think they learned a big lesson from that, and they went and, and uh, you know, they corrected the air conditioning problem, and then not coincidentally, you saw them roll out a tuition reimbursement program for their fulfillment center workers. But I do think there's um, an underlying challenge, you know, which is they're a discount retailer. You know, they're incredibly seasonal, so they inject, you know, a massive, you know, wave of, temporary labor into the system. You know, every fall they're gonna hire 70,000 workers. And these are fulfillment jobs. They're not glamorous. They're actually fairly brutal. And um, maybe they're, uh, you know, they're okay for 10 months of the year um, where, you know, workers, you know, have, have more of an impact, where they can suggest ideas, where there's a lot of opportunity for advancement. But there are two months of the year where those FCs are, are you know, they're battle conditions, and it's because, you know, Amazon's still growing, you know, 25 to 30 percent, you know, every holiday season, and, and, and the manpower that's required to run those things is immense, and breaks are short, and of course, I mean, these are huge malls full of free items, so, you know, theft is actually a real problem, and uh, so they got to, you know, subject their workers to, uh, to long security lines. You know, and frankly, um, they kind of screw up the model if they get too nice, right? They've kind of, you know, locked themselves into a, a corner uh, because, you know, they want to match the lowest price anywhere, and they need the cost structure to support that. So Amazon's never going to be a truly benevolent, you know, employer uh, of the workers in its FCs because then prices are going to have to rise, and Be Bezos has a real allergy, allergy to that. And they've been on such a growth tear that, uh, that even President Obama used their Tennessee warehouse as a backdrop for a, for a jobs discussion. So they've become kind of a poster child for, for growth. It's, uh, and very strategically have, have used the, the specter of new jobs uh, to kind of offset some of the criticism. So now, 
um, as journalists that cover Amazon, I, I'll get a, a press release, you know, once a week talking about the 10,000 new jobs they're creating in Florida or Connecticut or wherever they're opening a new fulfillment center. So we've talked about what it's like to work there. What's it like to be a business partner? What if, you know, if you're a book publisher, what do you think of Amazon? Uh, you're probably not too happy with Amazon. Um, I would divide it into two categories. Um, you know, one are, are, the, are you know, big companies that, that partner with Amazon or rely on Amazon. And there the record has not been good. You know, um, uh, the big retailers that allowed Amazon to run their websites and their, op and their online operations in 2000, 2001, you know, Toys R Us, Target, Borders, there, was a, there were a couple of them. I'm sure, you know, they all terribly regretted the decision. Uh, Toys R Us, you know, was involved in litigation with Amazon. It was a terrible move by them because, you know, they, they took a pass on figuring out an important part of their business. And Amazon, completely consumed with its own business, usually gave them somewhat short thrift. And then there's the second category of developers, um, maybe small retailers on Amazon's marketplace, you know, the companies that use Amazon Web Services. And there, I think the record, you know, is, is, uh, is better. Amazon considers that a customer set. And so, of course, you know, the hollow customer is sacred. And they have a, a better time, although you do hear from a lot of retailers um, that there's a lot of friction of selling, and perhaps that's a different topic, but a lot of friction of selling on Amazon because you're competing with Amazon. So it's naturally an uncomfortable relationship. And now, actually, they're, because they've basically given up their fight against collecting state sales tax, they're kind of on board with, at least in some of these industry lobbying groups with all the other retailers out there, aren't they? That's right. No, they've, that's been a really interesting fight to watch as, as they went from, uh, you know, starting in 2008, I think, when, when New York uh, cash-strapped New York State started uh, levying a sales tax and Amazon saw its sales drop in the state, you know, they, they fought it bitterly. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, in some cases employing lobbyists and in California initiating a ballot fight. And, and I think around 2011, 2012, coincidentally, around the same time they, they were introducing the Kindle Fire tablet and really making a play for the hearts and minds of, you know, of, of consumers and gadget owners. They kind of realized, I think, that the image cost of fighting the sales tax battle was starting to exceed, uh, you know, the benefits they were getting. And perhaps at the same time, Amazon Prime is taking off and they've really got the loyalty of a lot of their best customers. And we, we did really see them uh, turn around and, and start to uh, align themselves with the big box retailers. And now the outlier is eBay. And that's a little bit of a complicated kind of scenario, but you know, eBay is trying to carve out an, an, an exemption for its small sellers. Whereas Amazon and the big box guys, you know, sort of want everyone to collect sales tax evenly basically believe like they don't want to see another Amazon grow up. So part of what collecting sales tax means is that they can take these gigantic warehouses and position them very close to cities. What's going on in California? I mean, this is a place where they weren't collecting sales tax. We've been paying sales tax on Amazon sales for decade, you know, for over a decade. But what's going to what's going to happen in some of these other cities where they have warehouses near right. cities? Right. Well, one word groceries. <clears throat> so you guys have been paying sales tax, but you've also been able to buy all your fruits and vegetables on Amazon. Um, and, uh, you know, they've, they've been working on Amazon Fresh here for years. And, you know, of course, to, to, to run a successful grocery business, you know, you need your fulfillment center close to your customer, and you have to run, you know, trucks around uh, your, your, uh, your dense urban areas. And so I think that's coming. Um, we'll see. Um, it's obviously like the hardest problem in e-commerce to figure out and we saw a lot of companies try it during the dot-com boom and go out of business right away but you know i again I, I return to the title of the everything store you know he he wants to be the biggest retailer in the world and to do it he's got to figure out groceries and he's got to figure out apparel so i, I don't want to take away one of the great s scoops of your book but since you've already excerpted it in business week i i, I feel okay doing that um talk about finding Jeff Bezos' biological father and, you know, any, any part of that, that uh, story that you care to relate? Sure. Well, you know, I, to tell the Amazon story, you, you just have to tell the Jeff Bezos story, right? I mean, this is a company that is the product of one man's vision and his drive and his stubborn unwillingness you know, to let it go when nobody believed, you know, when, when a lot of the members of his senior executive team left his side in 2000, 2001. 
And then going forward from that, you know, his ability to, you know, craft new business models, you know, when online retailing seemed like, you know, a, a, fa a, a fairly uninspired business considering, you know, the Googles of the world that were growing up around him. So, you know, I have to ask the, the question, you know, where, where does this singular driven character come from? And, you know, it's the question that we ask, you know, all, all the people of, we ask of all the people that change our world. And it was remarkable to me, you know, that like Barack Obama or Bill Clinton or Steve Jobs, you know, or for that matter, Lance Armstrong or John Lennon, that, you know, there's, there are some interesting circumstances of Jeff's early childhood. He, you know, his parents were teenagers. Uh, his mom was 17 uh, when he was born. And, you know, his dad, his biological dad leaves his life when he's three and his mom remarries and he, he and Jeff now is a wonderful father, Mike Bezos, he took his name and, you know, and, and, and they're very extremely close as a family. But I kind of, you know, this was an untold part of the Amazon story. And I was wondering where, you know, where is this guy? What was his story? And, you know, to make a long story short, you know, the first revelation is that his father, Ted Jorgensen, I find by... Um, I find this out by, by looking at the old newspapers of Albuquerque, New Mexico in the 1960s, is a unicycle performer, like traveled the country with a unicycle group. Now, if you remember the years when Jeff is like, you know, inseparable with his Segway. So right away, I'm thinking this is, <laughs> is there some biological propensity toward wheeled vehicles? <laughs> and, um, you know, so then, um, you know, we, we have the example of, of Steve Jobs' biological father being found running a casino or working at a casino in Reno. And, you know, so I'm starting, starting to get a little more interested and I decide to try to find him and to talk about, you know, I'm curious what he thinks about what his son has become. And, um, you know, I, I search for all the Ted Jorgensons and I, I kind of do compare some birth dates and, I, and um, I find one guy is running a bike shop outside of Phoenix. And, you know, it seems plausible that the unicycle uh, guy is running a bike shop, and Google has this feature um, as part of uh, Street View where you can look inside some stores. And so I go to look inside his store. Again, this is elements of the story are just fortunate. Um, and I can I can I can see a kind of panorama inside a store. And on the wall of his store, you know, I see what looks to me like you know some some photos of some unicycle, you know, folks. And so I'm pretty, con I'm pretty convinced that I found him. You know, I found the missing piece of the Jeff Bezos story. So I, at the end of last year, and I somewhat strategically kind of save this to the end of my research because I don't know what I'll find. Um, I, I go down to Phoenix and I rent a car and I drive out to Glendale to, to his shop. And I walk in and I see on the wall there's the unicycle photo and I'm pretty confident. And I introduce myself and I say that I'm working on a book about Amazon and I'd like to, you know, as the father of the, as the biological father of the CEO, I'd like to tell his story. And he has no idea what I'm talking about. And it was, it was, you know, it was a, it was a, a surprising moment. Um, he, he hadn't known what had happened to, to his son and he, uh, after, after they left Albuquerque and he had spent his whole life wondering. That's amazing. Well, what do you think is the greatest challenge for the, for the company? Um, I mean, Bezos is so closely identified with Amazon. Is there not, is the big risk that what's life like after Jeff for Amazon? Absolutely. I mean, for all founder-driven companies, uh, you know, can you make the transition uh, after the founder decides to do something else? You know, Amazon, probably a little bit like Microsoft, it's even more acute because it's now such a diverse company. You know, it's a retailer, it's a digital services and hardware company, it's an enterprise software company. You know, who else on this planet is as versatile, is versatile enough to do that? Um, so that's one challenge. And there are some, some executives that have kind of grown up with Jeff uh, that, uh, you know, are the likely candidates, folks like Jeff Wilkie and um, Andy Jassy, who runs AWS. But more, but, but that's far out because Bezos is about to turn 50 next year and I don't, you know, he's not going anywhere. And, and more immediately, I think they face a, an interesting battle in devices because here, you know, Amazon with the Kindle Fire is up against, you know, Apple and they announced some new iPads today and Google and, you know, companies with, you know, deeper pockets and more kind of indigenous experience and hardware. And so, you know, they've, they've had some success so far, but the market share gains have been small. So we'll, we'll see.
we didn't even talk about his space endeavors, but uh, do you think he's going to space? I definitely think he's going to space. I think he wants to. Um, you know, actually one sort of interesting, um, you know, uh, physical transformation uh, as Amazon has grown, you know, Jeff is in pretty good shape now, right? He, he, you know, he wasn't, he, he, he looked a little pasty and rumpled back in the 90s. And now, you know, he's, he's clearly like working out every day. And the reason I bring that up is because, you know, I think he's an astronaut training. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I asked his mom about that and I asked her if she was nervous. Um, and she said, talk to me the day it happens. Uh, so, you know, he, he's the Star Trek generation and that's why he started Blue Origin. And I, I definitely believe he wants to do that. Are we ready for questions? So I think we're gonna take questions from the audience and um, I've been told that you're supposed to come up to the microphones uh, and ask them. So if you have any questions, please queue up. And we have about 20 minutes for questions. And I'd like to remind folks to keep your questions short and in the form of a question so we can get through as many as possible. Thanks so much. Um, since the title is The Everything Store, I guess I, I have a lot of questions, but um, <laughs> since it's everything, everything, what is shopping like in the future for us? I mean, we, t we talk all the time about same-day delivery, we talk about all these lockers and, and getting things to people fast, we talk about Walmart, and Walmart is the enemy, um, and Main Street is, is sacred and we want stores to be open and, and, and the wandering, you know, window shopping experience. So, um, you know, I, I'm a former Amazon reporter too, but since you actually know them probably better, better than I do, I'm s what's, what does the future look like? Did you address, I haven't read the book yet, so maybe um, you address the that. The future for Amazon is, is you know, blob-like expansion in almost every conceivable direction. Right, it's international expansion, it's product category expansion. So, you know, they, I don't think they believe there's any natural limit to what can be sold online. Is you know, it so the it's, ultimate consumer experience? It's, well, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, they've got to figure out the science of, of a lot of these product categories. They just started art. You know, you don't think of high-end art as something that can naturally be sold online. You know, but they, you know, he says he's, they're patient and they'll figure it out and they'll experiment a lot. Um, I think, um, you know, certainly same day uh, or next day delivery uh, is a battlefield now and we'll see who can figure it out with a, c a sustainable cost structure. And then maybe one day Amazon physical stores. You know, it's, it's like you go into a Microsoft store right now and, and if, if there's not a new service tablet, you know, it can seem a little grim, a little, you know, a little. And so, but Amazon's advantage is that, you know, they can sell their own stuff and they can sell everybody else's stuff. So you could have an iPad you know, in, in an Amazon store, or you could have the top books or the top, you know, uh, CDs. So uh, now that they've solved the sales tax problem, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see if should they start experimenting. Should consumers fight it though, or should they embrace it? Should. Should they fight it or embrace should it? Should Amazon fight? No, the consumers. Oh, should consumers, they? oh. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that probably would be a, sort of an individual choice. Um, you know, if you, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna have a local bookshop, you should shop there. You know, if you wanna support uh, the mom and pop retailers, you know, supporting, you know, uh, employees at a livable wage in your community, uh, and you want vibrant shopping centers, then yeah, you, you better shop there because otherwise they are going away. So this is a kind of a subset of the previous question. So Amazon and Walmart. So how do you see that one playing out? Wait, say again? Amazon, Walmart. This has been a bit in the news the last couple of weeks, the clashes of the two right. in, in Silicon Valley, but they seem so totally different, but it looks like they're coming at each other. So what, do you, right. what do you see? You know, I see in Walmart um, a, you know, a, a giant that is being disrupted and that is, you know, racing to, to try to catch up online and to turn, um, you know, a disadvantage into an advantage. So the disadvantage, you know, would be that they have a distribution system that's tailored toward supplying their stores. And, you know, Amazon has come in with a, you know, a fulfillment network that's very tailored towards shipping products from, you know, point A to point B, you know, point B being your, 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 your door. 
And it's a totally different problem. And, and you know, given what we've already discussed, which is low prices are directly proportional to your cost structure, you know, Walmart is having a hard time kind of meeting that uh, customer proposition. So what they're trying to do is turn their stores into an asset and fulfill from their stores. And I, I would argue that we haven't seen anyone successful doing that, but you know, don't bet against Walmart because you know, they're, they're you know, a, a $300 billion company for a reason. They actually seem similar in, in many ways to Costco. I mean, you, you actually talked about the influence that Costco's Jim Senegal had on, on Bezos' thinking about prices, and, and of course the membership model is very similar there as well. Yeah, in some ways Amazon has gone and built a, a Costco right inside it with Amazon Prime. Uh, you know, it's a good business when you can get your customers to pay at a shop at your store. Why don't we go over here? Um, I was really taken by your uh, phrase, cost structure. So cost structure means what you pay the people who make the goods. And the only way you can get the lowest price good is if you don't pay the people who made the good and shipped the good very much money. So what Amazon has done, in, in Walmart as well, and Costco, I think, um, really led a revolution in the destruction of a living wage in the United States and ultimately the middle, the middle class. But it's being sold to us as kind of a higher moral right that America deserves the lower price, the lowest price possible. And I wonder if you've ever heard any discussion among the Amazonians at any level about the moral, social implications of this. Well, I think it goes it goes back to something that we we discussed, which is you know this is you know this is an issue that's you know uh, a century in the making, right? As re as retailers have gotten bigger and the emergence of big box stores, and you know these companies that use their bulk to force scale discounts, we we see manufacturers move over overseas, and you know as prices go down, products seem to cheapen, and we lose jobs in the in the U.S. Uh, no, it's this is these, this is one of the big issues of 21st century retailing, and it's it's not just Amazon; it's it's all them, and it's something that every consu consumer should consider. Right. I'm not talking about the consumer. I'm asking if if within the Amazon culture, if there's any, it, I mean, to say that he has dreams, these wonderful, huge dreams, and he wants to be the biggest retailer, if his only value is to offer the lowest price possible to the customer, that seems very thin to me. And I'm wondering. I've often wondered. Is the ultimate goal then to raise prices once he owns everything? <laughs> it's, that's an excellent question. In fact, today we saw Amazon raise the minimum uh, threshold for their free shipping offer. You know, it went from twenty dollars to thirty dollars. Um, you know, at, at one point did they start to tinker with the mechanics of their discounts to show a profit or to, you know, uh, to to trigger the growth? Now. You know, I, I think um, you know all we have to go on is is uh, you know is is kind of past behavior, and by and large, you know there there's a, a pretty aggressive insistence to the you know to your point to the horror of many manufacturers and other retailers on the lowest price. I mean, it's kind of woven into the Amazon culture. So I really don't think they'll end up retreating on that. But you know, you make a very good point about the macroeconomic effects of of low prices, and um, you know, it's absolutely something to consider. Uh, could you speak a little bit to uh, Jeff's management style? Like, what would it be like to be one of his key executives, or somebody that sees him on a regular basis? Um, you know, the question is about Jeff's management style, which um, is, uh, you know, again, uh, like in the, in the mold of a Steve Jobs or a Bill Gates, uh, you know, probably best summarized by the phrase, does not suffer fools. You know, uh, he's got a high bar. Um, I actually have fun. I, in talking to so many Amazon employees, everybody seemed to have a kind of famous line, you know, some cutting, you know, line that Bezos had delivered to them. So I summarize, I have a part in the book where I just kind of list the greatest hits. And there... He goes know, into a state called Nutters. That's right. <laughs> and, and I had heard that that is what some employees called them, the, the Nutter, you know, where the, the vein and the forehead pops out and... You know, you're not you're not thinking big enough. You're not meeting the founder standards, and I can I can imagine there's no worse position to be in at Amazon, um, and it's why it's a tough place to work, and it's probably also why uh, he built a 65 billion dollar in revenue company in 19 years because this you know this in, this relentless insistence on getting the best from everybody and rethinking everything and driving ahead and forward, despite what 
the skeptics say. Lady over here. Hi. Um, I'm also a former Amazonian, and um, I managed the fitness business, and I sat next to the guy who managed kayaks, so it was funny <laughs> for me to hear that comment. Um, but internally, I would say there's a very strong um, sense of what the values and leadership principles are, and um, so it's sometimes hard to see the contradictions. And as a more objective expert, I'm wondering if you see any contradictions between maybe what Jeff says to you know, customers or journalists and how Amazon actually acts? Well, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think the, the central one is, is the contradiction between being customer focused and, you know, competitor focused, where he really does go out and say, you know, we're, we're very customer oriented and we watch what our competitors do, but we don't pay all that much attention to it. And I think the history shows that that, um, you know, they, they do and, and they can be pretty relentless in their response. And the, the, the reason that the Kindle exists, as you were saying before, is, is because they saw what was happening with music in the uh, iPod and assumed that something like that would happen also in books if they didn't get off their butts and do something about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And I think, you know, if Jeff had been watching ebooks, and I describe in the book about how he almost invested in Rocketbook in the 1990s. But it absolutely uh, became a priority and something he pushed and kind of dragged the publishers against their will into because he feared, you know, that Amazon's core franchise of books, the place where it started, could be co-opted by a competitor. Lady over here. Uh, as an Amazon customer, I'm very curious about the Washington Post acquisition. You mentioned that it happened right toward the end of your book development cycle. So could you sort of elaborate a little bit about how you see that what was the motivation behind it and how that fits into the future vision? Great. So the Washington, Washington Post, uh, you know, opportunity, I think, you know, he, Jeff didn't go looking for it, but, but it presented itself. We know now that the Graham family uh, was looking to sell and that even, you know, eBay founder Pierre Omidyar had been interested. And I think, you know, Jeff, one of the things that really emerged from my research is how, you know, big a reader he is. He reads newspapers every day. Um, you know, so many important Amazon decisions have come from books by business thinkers or even novels, you know, that, that the leadership team has read. And of course, famously, they start all their meetings by, by reading a six page document. So he's very tuned in. Um, and, and, you know, unlike actually a lot of other big tech companies, he has built an editorial business uh, for authors in the Kindle. And so, you know, I sense that the opportunity presented itself. He, he felt like his resources and long-term vision and operating discipline could help revive the post. And while it's, he bought it independently, I wouldn't be surprised if he finds creative ways to use the post and, and, and the editorial content, you know, to, to help the Amazon uh, Kindle ecosystem. Um, you know, they're, they're fighting, you know, the Apple ecosystem and the Google e ecosystem with devices and, you know, tablets and services. And he's looking for ways to kind of distinguish Amazon's offerings. And right now they're making, they're making TV shows, you know, um, they're, you know, they're integrating it with the retail site. Uh, they're, you know, they're streaming movies for free. And, and I think one day maybe, you know, newspaper content could be part of that. We'll, we'll see. Um, as a recent transplant to Seattle, I'm just learning about Amazon Fresh, and I know you touched on it slightly, but I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about if you think they'll be successful in expanding this part of their business and how you think they'll be able to do this, uh, especially in light of some of the interest in local food, the local food movement, and how Amazon could possibly enter into this space. That's a great question. One of the prospects for Amazon Fresh it's, it's hard to <clears throat> bet against Amazon because they are really so patient in trying to figure these things out. So seven years of experimentation in, in Seattle, they're starting to move it out into LA, but we're seeing them build fulfillment centers all over. And I do believe that's because they see a future in grocery deliveries. And then look, like so many of these businesses, they don't actually have to make the grocery business work by itself. You know, it's a piece that fits into the, the larger flywheel of their business. So you, as you guys all know, um, if, you, if you use Amazon Fresh, you order groceries and you might get, you know, a DVD or something else you ordered in the mail. So it, be, it becomes a piece of their fulfillment network, the last mile to the customer. And as they move ahead with same day or next day delivery, you know, Amazon Fresh fits nicely into that category. So unlike almost everyone else, 
um, you know, there, there's a way in which groceries actually kind of complements the other parts of their business. So, you know, I expect them to, to r definitely roll it out and, and likely to be successful with it. I think we have time for a couple more questions. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on the six-page memos, sort of what they are, how they work, how they reflect Bezos's thinking style, management approach, and so forth. Sure, so the narratives. Now, this is where our former Amazon or current Amazon employees in the audience will run screaming out of the room from post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> uh, but this is, you know, very unique to Amazon. Um, he, he institutes it in 2003, I think, because he, he's upset at PowerPoint and believes it conceals lazy thinking and it takes up a lot of his time and, you know, time management is, is, is really at the top of Jeff's skill set. Um, and, and this is how he prefers to digest information. And he, you know, he believes that, you know, his employees really have to, have to distill their thoughts in a six-page document. And uh, so, so meetings are, are begun in silence as people pour over these documents. And it's, it's like, all, like so many things at Amazon, it's tuned to the way that Jeff processes information. I, I describe in the book, you know, Amazon is a series of chess boards, all of them kind of perfectly angled so he can play as many games as po as, at once as possible. And I think, you know, narratives fits into that. Maybe the last question here. I was wondering um, if you could comment on Jeff's maybe connectedness, uh, what circles he runs in, and particularly maybe over the last couple of years, did anybody ask him if he would ever consider running the Affordable Care Act uh, <laughs> website? The, the thought did occur to me that that Amazon would probably do a pretty good job with that. And of course, this, the CIA is now, you know, running its operations on Amazon servers. Um, you know, and maybe, maybe, maybe uh, we could have used some nutters in the uh, development of Obamacare. Um, so, and, and then was it, was there a question about kind of what social circles? That yeah, Jeff what social in? circles yeah. does well, he run? You know, he's, he's very private. Um, I talked to Danny Hillis, uh, you know, a computer scientist uh, who's a friend of Jeff's. Um, who, who works on the clock of the long now, you know, they're close. Uh, and, and, you know, he, uh, he has a very tight-knit family, um, you know, four kids and um, an extended family. And, you know, <laughs> my impression is he's got a lot on his plate professionally as well. So uh, that's probably all I could say about that. So why don't we just have one more? Thanks. Um, Amazon's been uh, perceived, at least, as not... Uh, been very uh, co contributing with us corporate social responsibility. And... Um, specifically giving back to the community, which it's really transformed. Um, I, I don't think Bezos even lives in, in Seattle, if I'm not mistaken. Do you see that changing? So as part of that Seattle Times series, Amazon was, uh, was, was I think, fairly critiqued for uh, its engagement in the life of the city and for, uh, you know, and for its phil philanthropy. And I'd say two things. You know, one, uh, and neither of these are meant to excuse the company. I mean, I think you know, there was one, it was one, it's one of those cases where, you know, they, they, uh, they, you know, they were fairly critiqued and they've had to adopt, adapt. Um, you know, the, the first is that, uh, you know, the primary challenge of Amazon over the last 19 years hasn't been, you know, fighting Walmart or fighting eBay or Barnes and Noble. It's been the complexity that comes with such rapid growth, you know, from three guys in a garage in Bellevue to 90,000 employees. And so their noses are buried in the mechanics of making this complex business work. Um, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, Apple, you know, gets another million customers and they, you know, and Foxconn makes an, another million iPads. Amazon gets another million customers and they have to rethink their entire distribution network because suddenly they got to stock a lot more products and figure out more efficient ways of getting their products from point A to point B. That's point one. And point two, back to my kind of, you know, discount retailers are built on, on efficient cost structures, you know, it, they're frugal to the bone. And the, and, and the philanthropy and, and donation matching, it's another way in which, uh, you know, Bezos spares no expense to be, you know, to preserve his singular focus on low prices. Well, Brad, thanks very much for coming to Seattle and to Town Hall, and thank you all so much for coming here. Thank you.